I'm going to talk to you about Tasty Query, which is a uh, library for analyzing Scala programs and also for analyzing sort of symbols from the class path uh, which, uh, of an application, including from Java and from Scala 2.13. So uh, my name is Jamie. I work at the Scala Center, and we're a nonprofit organization in, uh, at EPFL in Switzerland. And we are sort of sponsored by donations from these companies. But you may have known us because we've worked on in the past or continue to work on, for example, uh, tools like Metals or Scala Dex or SCASD, uh, and still continue to work on, for example, Scala JS. So uh, that's a bit about us, and we have a website. Please follow us on Twitter if you don't, Scala Lang, uh, for news on Scala and Scala Center. Uh, please join the Discord and our forums. And we also are on LinkedIn, so you can follow us there. So what is Tasty Query? Uh, basically, it's going to be a library that, well, it's already released in a sort of uh, beta version right now. But it's cross-platform currently for JavaScript and JVM as a Scala library. And it lets you, yeah, reason about and analyze APIs that have been defined in either Scala 3, Java, or Scala 2.13. Uh, it also allows us to extract the full information from tasty files, and we'll look at that in a moment. And the goal is to be simple to use, but uh, to have uh, independence from the compiler itself, which is more complicated. So Tasty itself is basically a general purpose intermediate representation for the Scala language, specifically Scala 3. Uh, so to give a little background on what is Tasty, we can imagine that the compiler is sort of this pipeline made out of uh, different components called phases, uh, where sort of each little pipe that you see here uh, is a different phase. So let's say you have a Scala file foo, and it goes in. And then we go through the parser, which is the thing that analyzes the text and turns it into a data structure inside the compiler. And we have the typer, which uh, basically checks that the program is all correct and does some very minor transformations like uh, desugaring uh, sort of syntax sugar. Then once we've gone through all these phases, we get to the phase that's called Pickler, and this is where we produce something that's called a Tasty file, and they have the extension like Tasty. So for uh, this, like for example, if foo.scala contains a class called foo, then it will produce a tasty file called foo. Um, so what is the tasty file itself? It's basically a representation of the typed uh, syntax trees from the compiler, which is basically like saying, oh, we have a class definition, and then inside the class definition, there's some method definitions, etc. and it's basically the structure of the code, but in a, a representation that the compiler understands. Tasty itself is sort of a binary format that's standardized uh, and versioned, and uh, sort of every version of the Scala compiler, we increase the version. Uh, and it's basically there to uh, produce signatures for downstream libraries. Uh, for example, when you publish a library to Maven, then how do you compile against it? How does the compiler know how to uh, link against some definition f uh, like to list in a collection, then it downloads the tasty file and reads the signatures there. And it also is the storage mechanism for inline methods, so uh, they need to be stored somewhere, and it's inside the tasty file. Then once we produce the tasty file, the, uh, the, the compiler representation of trees basically gets sort of simplified over time through many phases until we get to the back end, which is where we produce the Java class files, which people are more familiar with, I assume. Um, but the problem with class files is that they basically lose a lot of information, so they're not useful for uh, reading signatures in other libraries. Because, for example, you know, you have uh, a list of string, but when you get to the class file, it's basically just a list of who knows what. So to give you an example of what Tasty is all about, let's say you have this source file uh, for a class foo, and it just takes the string parameter. Then once we've gone through those phases and we reach the pickling phase, it kind of looks like this. So it's uh, 
we know it's in the empty package, we know it extends uh, object class, and we know that the X parameter is a private val, whatever. Then the tasty file gets written, and this is a sort of human readable format that you see on the screen. Uh, so it's basically organized by recursive uh, trees that are able to sort of reference each other. It's quite complicated. So why do we care about this tasty format? Uh, essentially, it stores the entire detail of the uh, program that you compiled from source in a sort of representation that is stable uh, when you, uh, with respect to linking to other dependencies. So you can compile library A, and it's in a jar file on Maven somewhere, and library B is on Maven somewhere. And then when you have your application downloading both of these libraries from Maven, then the tasty format is uh, not going to uh, change depending on which library dependencies you link, because we already know which method overloads exist. They're already being resolved, so adding a new method won't change that. And yeah, the implicit arguments have also been resolved, so there's no more searching for new implicits. Uh, so we know tasty exists but why do we need Tasty Query as a library? So I'm going to walk through a sort of example of uh, a dependency going wrong. Uh, so let's say you have an application, the orange box, and it depends on two libraries. We have the utility library in the top left and a macro library in the top right. And the macro library also depends on the utility library. Um, so this is kind of like what your build file would look like. You, you have your app and you just depend on these two libraries. And the code that we have is in the utility library, we have one method util, uh, uh, yeah, an object utils, and it has a method as list, just converts a sequence to a list. Then we have a macro in the macro library, which uh, is an inline method foo, and this is going to call the as list just with this uh, sequence argument one, two, three and then just compute the sum and return a string. Then in our application, we're just calling that foo method. So nothing's going wrong yet. This compiles fine if you were to try this yourself. So what does, when can this go wrong? Let's say that the utility library uh, releases a new patch version. So it has, you know, the, the, the third, uh, the patch field has gone up by one. And we know that supposedly, if you follow the SEMVER versioning scheme, then a patch release should be fine to upgrade, no worries. So we kind of uh, pick to update our version and pick the new version of the library. But we still depend on the macro library, which um, transitively depends on the old version of the utility library. So. If uh, the versioning scheme was correct, then this should be safe to compile. Uh, when we try and build app, it should work. But unfortunately, it does not. And so why is that? Uh, the problem is, is that even though the, utility, uh, the maintainers of the utility library followed all the best practices, they had uh, Mima turned on, which is a library that checks binary compatibility between two versions of a library. So Mima said, oh yeah, it was fine to turn uh, releases as a patch release. But the problem is, is that the library contained a tasty incompatible change, not a binary incompatible change, which caused the uh, app to fail when we upgraded. So the maintainers of utils were not aware that the change they made would have made a tasty incompatibility, so can we blame them? I don't know. So let's see <laughs> how tooling can help uh, them discover the change. So what went wrong? Here's what we had before. And I want you to pay attention to as list method in the utility library. So the argument has, is typed as sequence of integer. Then when they release their upgrade, so now uh, this is what it looks like after, the utility uh, library is now changed as list to take a var arg of integer rather than seek of integer. And this is going to cause a, uh, the compiler to fail in, in app, 
even though that was a binary compatible change. So the problem that will happen is as soon as you try and recompile app, then you'll get a stack trace saying, oh yeah, I couldn't type check foo anymore. And uh, the reason is because the sequence argument to as list doesn't work. And so this is the kind of stack trace you see. So yeah, I couldn't type check um, the macro foo because we passed a sequence of integer when it was supposed to be an, a single int argument. So to summarize, uh, yeah, we're going to recompile the, the new application against the new dependency for utils. And the app method calls the foo uh, macro in the macro library. But the macro library still depends on the old utility library. Then when we try and inline the macro body, then it calls that as list method from, but uh, the compiler sees only the new library, not the old library. And because it only sees the new library, then that sequence argument inside of app now does not link anymore. So it should have been passed as a var arg argument with like seek with the star at the end. But anyway, so the summary is, is that these two libraries are not tasty compatible. So the idea here is that if we have a tasty query, then we can use it to build a tool that will be able to check that when you have two different versions of libraries that the uh, API can still be consumed. So we were going to use it to validate API compatibility between releases and that will be a tool called Tasty Mima at the moment. Uh, we already use uh, Tasty Query in the debugger of metals. Uh, so basically uh, when you try and step into uh, methods to I don't know, go into them, then it will skip sort of synthetic definitions like uh, uh, that you don't actually see in the source code, so they can be quite annoying uh, without the support from Tasty Query. Uh, also at EPFL, there's a research project to build a uh, interpreter over Tasty, which is kind of like cool. Um, we're not sure what it's good for other than just research purpose. Okay, and, and now I'm going to try and walk you through how you can use Tasty Query yourself to do something cool. So let's say, uh, yeah, you want to analyze inheritance of classes in the Scala library. Um, as a small example, here's basically, uh, yeah, class A extends B with C, and then we have class B and class C, I mean trait C, and we want to just produce a graph that looks like this. Uh, and I'll do a demonstration of that later. So the first thing you need to get started with the Tasty Query library is basically to uh, build what's called the class path. Um, so class path is almost uh, anything that you would pass to the dash class path argument to the compiler, or uh, you know when you do uh, library dependencies in in SBT. But essentially, it's like a list of paths, and uh, each one of these. Uh, paths is either going to be a jar file or a directory. Uh, so for example, here we have the classes uh, from my library, and then we have the jar for Scala 3 library, then the jar for the Scala 2 library, and then we have this funny path here, which basically means uh, the Java standard library. Um, yeah, and then inside each of those paths is basically a tree of uh, class files. And to represent that in Scala, we are just going to uh, make a list of paths that we can access with paths.get, and that just comes from Java NIO. So imagine we have this uh, list of paths. Then in Tasty Query, what we do is we uh, use this class path loaders object to read that into a class path. Uh, so it's typed as class path. And basically, uh, we can then produce a map between the uh, paths that we saw here and the actual loaded information uh, by, for example, yeah, here we take the, the class path paths that we had and then we zip with the entries of this class path to make a map. So this just basically lets us say what is the, what were the classes that were loaded from the Scala library, for example, in a map. Uh, so yeah, so when we do that, we get a class path, and what is that? So it's basically just a data structure that holds in memory the contents of every single class 
uh, file and tasty file in the class path. And yeah, so it's basically organized as a list. Uh, and the point is this, is that we don't have to have a different implementation of, for JavaScript or JVM. Um, then once you have a class path, you need to make a context. And a context wraps a class path. And uh, basically, you need a context in order to analyze any definitions in the class path. And we have a convenience method CTX, which just lets you uh, use whatever contextual context is in scope, because uh, here's how you would create the context. You do context in it with a class path, and then assign it to this given definition context, and then use CTX to summon that definition in the code. And uh, you can import it from here. So that was kind of a lot, but how do we uh, use that to only find the classes specifically just from the Scala library jar? So we have that lookup that we had earlier, which uh, basically stores the paths and the entries and then in a map, and we're going to say, okay, find in the map the, uh, the path that sort of looks like Scala library, and we'll just get the entry from that. And then what we do is we call this method uh, find symbols by class path entry, and then we pass the class path entry into that, and then we just get all the classes that were from that entry. Uh, yeah, so we, from that, then we get a list of sim, uh, iter iterable of symbol, uh, but what is a symbol? It's basically uh, a point in the graph of all everything in the class path, and it means this definition exists, it's uh, got this unique identity, and then from that symbol we can access all the information about that definition. And uh, we have a lot of specialized symbols depending on the kind of definition. So at the root we have symbol, but then let's say you have uh, a package symbol for packages, and then we have type symbol for types and term symbol for terms, and then type symbols can be either a class or a type member of a class or a type parameter. And then uh, we also have this thing called declaring symbol, which is anything that can have symbols that you look into. So like classes have declarations and packages have classes, so you need to look into that. So once you have a class symbol, here's some useful things you can do. You can call uh, parent classes to get the list of parents. We can call full name to get the fully qualified name. Or to get its owner, then you call the owner. And then uh, it's important to basically, whenever you want to find a method inside a class, you need to have a name and then you call get decal with the name. And then that lets you look up inside a class uh, whatever definition you want. So let's compare that to the Scala uh, compiler API because Tasty Query is inspired by the Scala compiler, but it's very much simplified because uh, it only needs to know the state of the world at when in the tasty file, whereas the Scala compiler needs to care about uh, before type erasure, after type erasure, whether you got files from the REPL, many things. So we uh, simplify a lot because we only need one view, and we try and specialize um, as much as possible. So for example, yeah, we have three different kinds of symbol, and then to look up the type of a term, then you call this method. So basically we have specialized methods for each interaction. But in the Scala 3 compiler, basically you have just this one info method that gives you everything, and uh, it's kind of a lot harder to reason about. Uh, okay, so once you've seen what symbols do, now let's go back to our, uh, our goal, which is to say, okay, we're trying to figure out the inheritance of classes in the Scala library, but specifically only in the Scala, uh, the mutable collections package. So um, before I showed you how to look up uh, entries in the class path by a specific thing, so we saw how to get just the Scala library classes, so that's this. Uh, and then if you want to find just the ones that are inside the uh, mutable collection package, then you can use this find package uh, method on the context. 
and then you just pass the, the name of the package and you'd get a package symbol. And then we're gonna go through the classes that were in the Scala library and uh, collect only when they're a class symbol and where the class's owner is the mutable package. Okay, so once we've seen that, uh, once we've seen that, then how do we actually build this graph? Uh, a very basic not performant algorithm is just, uh, we have the list, let's say we have a list of links and links are just saying class A inherits from class B. And then we put the class into a set and then we take the, the first thing in the explore and we say, okay, what is the, the, parents, uh, the parent classes of A? And then for each of those parents, we add a link to the links. And then we just say, okay, add that parent back to explore until there's no more parents to explore and we have the links. Um, now I can do a demonstration. So, uh, yeah, so to make this demonstration, I'm going to basically produce a mermaid graph of the um, inheritance of classes uh, in the collection, Scala collection mutable package from the Scala library 213.10 jar. So, um, to kind of reiterate over what I did before, uh, I have here a list of paths, which is basically just the, uh, the list that I showed you earlier of the files that it has in here. Uh, basically, the, the Scala 3 library and its dependencies, which includes the Scala 2 library. And then we also have the Java library here. Um, and then, yeah, we pass those uh, paths into class path as read, and we get a class path. Then we b build that lookup map that we saw earlier and we initialize the context, okay. So then once we want to look up specifically the things in the, in the, Scala, 3 li in the Scala 2 library in the mutable package, so we call inheritances. Um, so we're going to look up the entry that matches the, the, the Scala library jar here then we use that thing I showed earlier, find symbols by class path entry to say, oh, here's the only things, the things that are just in this jar file. Then we're going to say, go through all those things in the Scala library and say, only if it's a class where its owner is this package, then we keep the class. And then I'm just going to take 10 of those because it would take forever to render the entire Scala library. And for each of those classes, I'm going to call this inheritance method, which basically produces that graph that I just described. So this is just the graph of inheritance. And pretty much how that works is uh, I iterate through the explore, which is just the class I'm currently inspecting. I get its parents. And then for each of those parents, I add a link to just say class one inherits, inherits from the parent and then I put it all in a graph. So what does this look like? Uh, I click run from the code lens, and this is what it looks like. So what I've produced is a web page that just says, yeah, so what is the graph of inheritance? For example, array builder, we see that it inherits from reusable builder, which inherits from object, and then it inherits from this, et cetera. So some, some of these do get quite, quite big, which uh, can be scary. For example, string builder is huge. I'm not sure I can actually zoom in any more than that. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so just to prove I didn't hard code this, just do immutable. So this is now the immutable package. Uh, so yeah, now we have vector five. What is, what is that? Big vector. Well, wow. okay. Uh, yeah, so the, if you want to redo this, I have a gist that I could share. And you can explore to heart's content. 
Um, okay, so I'll just give a shorter overview of everything else that's in the Tasty Query library. So we already saw, um, well, yeah, so basically these are the, name, the main modules you need to care about. So we have symbols, names, types, and trees. You can import uh, the contents from here. And yeah, we saw symbols already, so it's important to know what names are. So for any symbol, you can get the name of the symbol by calling dot name. And it's basically um, like a rich data structure. So actually symbols, you might think they're just a, a lookup by string or something like that. But actually, uh, depending on the kind of definition, if it's a term, you need term name. And if it's a type, you need type name. And then we also have this crazy thing called a signed name, which is basically, uh, when you have two overloaded methods, like foo uh, with two parameters and foo with one parameter and a target name, then how do we look up the correct foo? And the answer is that you just get a sign, well, you need to produce a signed name for it. And it kind of looks like this, but it does, it's not actually how it is. But yeah, yeah basically a signed name takes the, uh, the result of the target name and it adds the type erasure of the method here, and uh, gives you a signature, and all these signatures have to be unique, basically, per overload. Um, if you have two overloads with the same signature, then there's going to be ambiguity, so uh, it's important that they're unique. Next thing to look at is types, and you're going to get the type, of a si uh, for example, of a term symbol by calling declare type, and we have two kinds of type, type bounds and type. This is kind of quite complicated to go into. But just some examples are, for example, a term ref, which could be like scala.object. No, uh, scala.predef would be a term ref, for example. And then trees, you can get the tree of any symbol that was compiled from tasty with the dot tree method. If it came from Java or from Scala 2.13, then it will be, uh, it will be none, because it returns option. And yeah, we have two kinds of trees. We have type trees and trees. And there's ways to uh, recurse over these trees so you can analyze, for example, how many, uh, how many if statements you have without an else branch or something like that. Um, yeah, and then let's look at some other things you could do. So if you have several types, if you have types, then you can check if they subtype each other, which is uh, by calling that is subtype, then it's uh, basically the same operation as you have with this type um, operation here. Um, and then you can also look up any definitions inside of a type with member. And then you can check if a type references a specific symbol with is sim. Uh, and then, yeah, also you can check if methods uh, override each other or you could say, uh, I have this method here and I have a class and then you can say, uh, look in the uh, parents of this class and find any symbols that were overridden. So this is kind of important to analyze uh, if overrides get broken. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at if you have Tasty Query. People might say, why do we need Tasty Query when we have all these other alternatives? Uh, so for example, why don't we use the Tasty Inspector library that comes with Scala 3? Uh, the main answer to this is that uh, basically Tasty Mima will need to have two different versions of a library on the same, uh, at the same time. And Scala 3 doesn't really handle having two definitions that uh, collide with each other at the same time. So we need, we need a more sophisticated way to manage the class path, which Tasty Query does. Um, the other potential that people might want to use is Scala Meta, which is uh, a library that also allows you to analyze trees of source code and also extract the types. Uh, but Scala Meta is best used for uh, actual looking at the source code before. So it has um, all the desugarings that have been applied, uh, which Tasty does not have. So Scala Meta is better for implementing like uh, linters and uh, formatting tools. Um, so I want to summarize now 
that, uh, yeah, so tasty query will be critical for uh, the future of Scala's Scala ecosystems infrastructure to uh, make sure that when, uh, when maintainers release a new library that their versioning is correct and won't cause downstream breakages. And we wanted to have a simple API to inspect definitions from all over the class path. Uh, it's going to be cross-platform over Scala JS and JVM. And we wanted to kind of, uh, yeah, be able to be used for different kinds of users, so not only compiler experts, but also people who just uh, want to perform some analysis on their code to see, oh, am I uh, using this method that is uh, on my exclude list or something like that. So you can find the You can find uh, more about it at, on GitHub at Scala Center slash Tasty Query. And we have some API docs that you can find out more about all the kind of things you can do in here. Um, yeah, so that was basically it. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> Related to the slide where you had why not use, um, mm. one thing that popped into my head was the Scala 3 compiler can also emit semantic DB for stuff. So in what scenarios would you say is it more appropriate to use Tasty over semantic DB and maybe some of the, some of the pros and cons versus those two of them? Because yeah, the compiler emits both basically. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. So semantic DB has, um, a sort of weaker version of the type system. So it basically can represent types syntactically, but not really compare them in any way. And the idea with Tasty Query is that you can uh, be able to relate different definitions to each other to say, does this override that or something like that. But I know that in Scala Meta it's, uh, and Semantic DB, you have all these uh, relationships baked in so you can already look up what are the uh, overrides um, because it's pre-generated. So yeah, so semantic DB is really good for fast lookup, like for a text editor. Uh, but then I think if you have some more complex algorithms, you need more rich information, and that's what Tasty Query is for. Any other question? Would you like to see more demonstration? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can try and do this without breaking. So let's not look in the Scala 2 library. We could look in the Scala 3 library. Um, So I'm going to look in the Scala runtime package in Scala 3. And you can see it's way more simple than the collections library. <laughs> uh, I could try doing tasty query itself. I need to add that to the class path. <laughs> I don't know how long do I have left. Oh, the five, okay. No, I don't know if I could do that in time. Yeah, okay. So do Tasty Query 3, and we have currently version 0.3.1. So you're the same version, but you can talk to Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, I'm using Corsia here with 
inside Scala CLI. So let's put and then I want to do tasty query. I actually don't know what's going to happen now. I don't think there's any classes in just tasty query. Whoa. Yeah, there's nothing in there. Um, because most things are not top level classes, so I'm not. I could do it in exceptions, there we go. Yes, because they're not packages. <laughs> That's why. Um, which is cool. So find static module class. OK, so actually we're going to do this. It should be the kind of names that we see. Which one? Maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> oh, there's nothing in here. OK. I can't believe this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, just remove that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Sorry, everyone. That was unexpected. Wow, there we go, some stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other question? Okay. Yes. Could we do code coverage? Yeah, the Scala 3 has code coverage built in in the new 3.2. Yes, release. but we could move the coverage measure outside the compiler. Yeah, you can you can thing. traverse the trees and see which definitions are being used inside um, the body of a method. So I guess that could cover your use case. Ah. Uh. Okay, you can count the usages of methods, but you wouldn't be able to analyze at runtime, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's the good thing, actually. Can you make a serializer so you can generate tasty from tasty query? It's pop yeah, that would, that would be a good test case to check that we actually do it correctly. To, uh, yeah, to read tasty from tasty query and then generate tasty again. Yeah. And then with instrumentation added. Or yeah, okay, that's a, that's a very... Uh, Cool idea. Let's let's do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, there's one here. <laughs> Just a really small one. Uh, with uh, the tasty files that are generated, can they be used in isolation at all, or do you need all of them for the entire code base? Um, the problem is, is that if you tasty files usually have references to other classes. Um, that don't exist. Uh, so, I mean, we have this method filter, which can sort of restrict a class path to be a specific list of classes. Yeah. So if you fancy finding the smallest set of classes necessary, that could work. 
but yeah, it, they're, most tasty files depend on everything. So it's tough. But uh, actually, no, to answer your question, you could look at one file in isolation because uh, the way we resolve symbols is lazily. So you can just look at the sort of syntactic structure of it, but once you try and compare things, then you'll, you'll say, it will say that I couldn't find this dependency, so. Yes. Hey, um, so I, I don't know much about uh, neither Tasty or compiler stuff or uh, Mima. I'm like, I don't really do like libraries mm -hmm. usually. I mostly consume them. Um, but so you basically showed an example where Mima wasn't able to find something that should have, should, could have been caught maybe mm -hmm. with such a tool like Tasty Query. Why would it not just be a part of Mima? Um, could you repeat that? Part, please. So if, if you're saying that Tasty Query would manage to find issues that Mima could not, mm -hmm. basically, yeah. wh why would we just not make Tasty Query a part of Mima and make have Mima use Tasty Query to find what could not be found find before? Ah, I see. Um, that that could be possible. It's it's uh, still not begun yet, but yeah, I mean we could make it a dependency of each other. It's it's possible. We're still exploring what's the best way to mi build this uh, Mima for Tasty. So, yeah, not not many much I could say. No. Okay. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs>